That meeting with the CEO is coming up. You've been poring over the data and pulled a few high-level descriptive stats. But as you dig deeper into the sales data, you're having trouble seeing the trends in the numbers. Don't worry, data visualizations are here to help. We often think of data visualizations as being for our audience, but effective data visualization can help us analyze and reason. Before we begin, there are a lot of different styles of visualizations. We're going to cover just a few used heavily in our first statistics courses, line charts, bar charts, histograms, box and whisker charts, and scatter plots. Line plots typically show a time series. The series you see now happens to be the price of Tesla shares from 2019. With these charts, the x-axis tends to be the independent variable. That is, the variable whose value doesn't depend on anything else. This is almost always a measurement of time. Time doesn't change based on the price of Tesla, making it an independent variable. On the y-axis, you'll typically place your dependent variable, a variable whose value is dependent on the independent variable. Our price does depend on the date. Bar charts are helpful for displaying a variable across different categories. Now, those categories can be chunks of time, as shown here, where Tesla 3 production is chunked across different quarters. Since quarters have a natural progression, it does sort of create the sense of a time series like in our line plot, but the bar chart can work well when our categories have no natural progression. Consider this chart of the number of models produced by color. This method helps us to identify both the quantity and ratio. Histogram is similar to a bar chart. It provides an approximate representation of the distribution of a data set. To create a histogram, data is put into bins. In this example, returns that are between 0 and 2% are being lumped into one bin and 2 to 4% in another. We've essentially created categories for our numbers based on ranges. You can see a bit of a positive skew in this chart of Tesla returns in 2019. They were having a bit of a run that year. Box and whisker charts shows us quartiles, but in graph form. In this case, we are shown daily gains of Tesla in 2019. We see the gains for H1 and H2. The median is represented by the horizontal line in the middle of the box. Sometimes the average is indicated by an X. The whiskers show us any extremes of our total range, while outliers that we may not have included are shown as dots lying outside that range. Each dot represents a single observation. They're a bit funny looking, but box and whiskers charts convey a lot of information in a very small space. You see the central tendency, range, and you even get a sense of the shape of the data. Its small size makes it great for when we have a lot of distributions which we want to compare. Finally, let's have a look at scatter plots. Scatter plots are useful for visualizing correlations or relationships between quantitative variables. When there is no correlation, the scatter appears a bit like a cloud. Correlations can be positive or negative, strong or weak, exponential, and more. Sometimes, you'll see a regression line drawn through the middle. A regression line is a straight line that lies as close as possible to every point in the scatter plot. Okay, those are the five visualizations you'll want to be familiar with. Line charts and bar graphs are great for visualizing our descriptive statistics, like your sales data. Meanwhile, histograms, scatter plots, and box and whiskers are going to be useful as we move into inferential statistics and want to visualize differences, correlations, and distributions. In this video, we're going to explore some data in Excel using the Data Analysis Toolpack. Before we begin, let's make sure we have the toolpack added. Go to File, then Options, then find Add-ins in the left menu and open the tab. At the very bottom, it will say Manage. Pick Excel Add-ins from the dropdown and hit Go.
make sure Analysis Tool Pack is selected. If you don't see it as an option, you might need to click Browse and look for it. Once it's selected, hit OK. You may be prompted that it's not installed. If so, click Yes to install it. Now let's take a look at our data. We have five years worth of data from the S&P 500 index taken from 2014 to 2019. A good practice when analyzing data within Excel is never mess with the original data. Instead, make copies of what you want to edit. So let's add a new sheet, then copy all our data and paste it there. Let's also remove the title so it doesn't get in the way. We want to look at the percent change. We also want to peek at the price data. Let's clean this up. Delete these other columns. Then, from our price data, let's make a line plot to show the overall trend for the period. Select the Price and Date columns. Go to Insert, Recommended Charts, and we'll grab the line chart. We can see here there is a general uptrend, which is no surprise. Index investing is often promoted as good at following the general market, and the general market tends to go up. So if you're in that camp of thinkers on indexes, then this trend should be pretty expected. Okay, let's look at some descriptive statistics. You're probably aware that there are individual Excel functions to get an average, median, single or multiple modes, min or max values, the standard deviations, and even a skew or other measurements of the distribution. Instead of using these functions, we're going to get all our descriptive stats at once using the Data Analysis tool. So head to the Data tab. Then find Data Analysis on the right and scroll to find Descriptive Statistics. Click OK. Let's click in the range box and then select our range. Let Excel know it's a column. Check the box to let Excel know we have a label in our first row. And let's output this data into this sheet instead of creating a new tab or workbook. Click the white box, then just select a cell in a blank area of your sheet. This is where our data will appear. And finally, select Summary Statistics. Click OK. And there we have all our descriptive statistics. Let's make this a bit easier to read. Since our original data was in percentages, let's convert this into percentages as well, and remove a few decimals. looks good. So what do we see here? The mean is slightly positive, 0.04%. That makes sense as we saw it had an uptrend. The median is 0.05%. Recall what a difference between a mean and a median means, which is there's some skewness. And the skewness measure confirms it. For skewness, a value of zero is the absence of any skew. A negative skew means most of our values are more clustered on the positive side. And another way to see skew is with a histogram, so let's try that out. So back to our Insert tab. Let's select the columns, and any versions of Excel that are 2010 or later should have an option for a histogram. And we can see that there are a lot of positive points here, very slightly, but it's a bit heavier. Let's up the granularity. You can see more data clustered around the positive side and a bit more fatness in the tail to the negative side. Another interesting point is the kurtosis. A normally distributed kurtosis has a value of 3. Since this is over 3, with a 3.78, we can see that it's more clustered towards the middle and has fatter tails, with some outliers that are very far out. As for range, from the lowest to the highest, you can see there is a 9.26% difference. The lowest value on any given day is roughly around negative 4.2%, while the maximum is about 5%. On a larger time frame, our range would not be quite like this. In fact, if you're aware of the S&P 500's broader history, this is a good example of how, when you're looking within a subsample and making investment decisions, 
It can be very deadly when you don't model for black swan events. That is huge outliers. So if you make an investment thesis around the idea that on any given day, the market can only go down negative 4.2%, then it happens to go much over that, that could be detrimental. That's just something to keep in mind when using past data to make decisions. It's why there's always the disclaimer that past results are not indicative of future performance. What else might we explore with this data? You may have also heard the saying, you should always buy the dip. The general uptrend supports that argument, but we can pull up a different visual to examine that idea a bit deeper. Let's add a stacked area chart. And let's line that up with our line chart. And what do we mean by buy the dip? How big is a dip? Well, let's set an arbitrary rule that any day when the market dropped by 2.5%, you would have bought it. Let's draw that out on the screen. So we'd buy at the red lines, say here in September, and again in July, and you would have done quite well in even a fairly short term. You'd buy again here in Feb 2018, and it's not just when you buy, but how long you hold that matters. You'd probably have been pretty sweaty for a bit at some of these dips, but you still would have done well if you're holding it for several weeks. So we discussed how visualizations can help us with analysis and reasoning. We're better analyzing a trading principle like buy the dip with just some side-by-side -side visualizations. That's enough of a demonstration of these Excel tools for this chapter. In chapter four, as we get into hypothesis testing and inferential statistics, we'll jump back into Excel's data analysis tool to run some t-tests together with new data sets.